Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you do not have a Bible, it's okay. It will be projected for you on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. It says, when the Lord, your God, brings you into the land you are entering to possess. Somebody say blessing. blessing. When the Lord God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Jezreelites and Amorites and Canaanites and Perizzites and Hittites and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you defeat them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty. Please don't breeze past this. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not and to marry with them. Somebody say, this is not your type. <laughs> say it with confidence because we're coming for your life in a little bit. Say, this is not your type. Not your type. Do not intermarry with them. I don't care how fine they are. I don't care how good they look. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. So God is saying, listen, I'm about to bless you. I'm about to bless you. I'm about to promote you. I'm about to give you a blessing so big, it's about to blow your mind. Does anybody want that, a blessing that blows your mind? God says, listen, I'm about to blow your mind with what I'm about to do in this next season, but, somebody say but. Now this is a big but, <laughs> pun intended, but, <laughs> Somebody just caught that. <laughs> this conjunction, but you must not date. You must not hook up with. It's getting quiet now. You must not marry these individuals because they don't live a life that is surrendered to your God. Now listen, you have to understand. He's not just confining this to the people. He's saying these people follow patterns of idolatry. And if you hook up with them, they will turn your heart. These people follow patterns that are of this world, but you are not of this world. I don't want you to intermarry with them. Therefore, the litmus test, the evidence that God really has authored a thing is when it brings you closer to himself. Because because whatever is close to a thing, proximity determines temperature. The reason that Pluto is so cold, even though we don't consider that a planet anymore, it's like a dwarf planet. That's what I studied. I said, okay, I didn't even know that. It's a dwarf planet. planet. The reason that Pluto is so cold is because it's so far from the sun. But the reason that Venus is so hot is because it's so close to the sun. So whenever God sends you a thing, it will not have Pluto conditions. God's saying, I want something that keeps you close. Now, I'm going to give you more Bible. I touched on this last Sunday, but I want to pick up 2 Chronicles chapter 1. This is God talking to Solomon. Solomon has now become king. God comes to him in verse 7. It says, that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask for whatever you want me to give you. When I was studying this, I was like, I don't know if God could ask me that. <laughs> like, just imagine God saying, hey, whatever you want, just tell me. I'm like, God, I'd probably be sinning if I told you everything I want. Are you sure about that? But I want you to look how Solomon answers. Verse 8, Solomon answered God and said, you have shown great kindness to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord, let your promise to my father, David, be confirmed. For you have made me king over a people who are as numerous, numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead these people. For who is able to govern these great people of yours? God said to Solomon, since this is your heart's desire, 
and you have not asked for wealth. Some of us would have messed up right there. You have not asked for possessions. That's probably some more of us. You have not asked for honor. That's a little more of us. Nor for the death of your enemies. That's all of us. <laughs> Like, God, my ex, I need you to handle that, okay? Because they did me wrong. Because you did not ask for wealth, possessions, or honor, nor for the death of your enemies. And since you have not asked for long life, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I have made you king, therefore wisdom and knowledge will be given you. And I will also give you wealth, possessions, and honor such as no king who was before you ever had and none after you will ever have. God has a way of giving you what you didn't even ask for. That's the type of blessing I want. God blessed me so much where you blessed me in the areas that I didn't even know I wanted to be blessed in. But this is the thing that messed me up, y'all. This is the thing that messed me up. I'm like, how do we go? from being the wisest man who has ever lived. How do we go from being the wisest man to ever live, a king who's sitting on the throne just like your daddy did, and your mother is accredited to being the contributor of Proverbs 31? You know that scripture that in most ladies, I'm a Proverbs 31 woman, I'm Proverbs 31? If you do your biblical research, you will see that it is accredited to Bathsheba to be talking to her son, Solomon. Like, I'm telling you, like, she, like she is giving this information. This is the type of woman you look for. You look for a woman who has character. Son, you look for a woman who's virtuous. Because her worth is more than rubies. You look for a woman whose charm, you got to understand, her charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who loves the Lord, son, that's the type of woman that is worthy of praise. I'm trying to get men to, stand, men to understand when you have a woman who prays for you, that's having your back on a whole nother level. Okay, don't amen too hard. Because I'm sitting here wondering, like, okay, he got wisdom. He's the king. God's given him everything that he asked for. And I'm looking at this text, and I'm like, how did you go from all of that to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1? It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women hmm. besides Pharaoh's daughter. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edenites, the Synodians, the Hittites, all those other ites that we just read in Deuteronomy. All those ites. He loved all those ites type women. Okay? Now look, these were from the nation about which the Lord told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Are y'all seeing this? Y'all just read it with me in Deuteronomy chapter 7. When God is talking to the Israelites, he's saying, make no treaty with them. Don't have nothing to do with them. They not bait. That's bait. We're not looking at how fine they are. No, I need you to follow somebody who follows my principles. We just read that in Deuteronomy chapter 7. In 2 Chronicles, he's asking God, how am I going to have wisdom to govern all these people? I'm giving you all this wisdom. I gave your mama the best relational advice known to man that we are still hashtagging to this day. And you ask for wisdom. But how are you getting to a place where you're loving all the people that God told you don't mess with them? It says, don't intermarry with them, for, for they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Look at this, y'all. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Now, don't judge Solomon. Don't judge him because Solomon is just like you and is just like me. You got all this wisdom. Oh, here it is. Here come your scalp. All this wisdom. You come into service every Thursday night. You binge in series. You listen to podcasts. You've been to retreats. You've been to singles conferences. You've been to marriage conferences. And then you in small groups reading spiritually nutritious, edifying wisdom like a kingdom woman or a kingdom man by Dr. Tony Evans or relationship goals by Michael Todd. You're reading all of this spiritual nutritious ingredients, but you still keep picking the wrong one. 
All this wisdom, I can give you scripture, probably can quote more Bible than me. Know the scriptures, no confessions, been conferenced out. Know all of this wisdom, but just like Solomon, we keep loving hmm, the wrong thing. This, this text is revealing to me. It's possible for you to love the wrong thing. It's possible for you to love the very thing that's turning your heart from God. Not even that. It's possible for you to love and then also even be compatible with. Talk, Holy Spirit. It's possible for you to love and also be compatible with the very thing that is an assassin to your peace, an assassin to your spiritual growth, an assassin to your sanity, but you can't tell because it's your type. Oh, it's going to be good tonight. It's going to be good tonight. Compatible. This is why I did a video earlier this week and I uploaded it on social media because I was engaged in sermon prep. And I said, I need us to realize that compatibility can be a trap. Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You with your mouth open. Yes. Compatibility can be a trap. Two reasons. Number one, compatibility can be a trap because you can be compatible with a devil. Yeah. Devils know what you like too. Mm -hmm. I believe the enemy deliberately attaches pleasure to counterfeits. It's so good because it's so lethal. And now you can't even see through the lens of spirituality because both of y'all are compatible in sensuality. Yeah, devils, devils know what you like too. If you like her to be kind of short and have more curves in the highway, <laughs> the enemy will send you exactly what you like. It is pain gift wrapped as your preference. If you like for him to be tall, he got to be six feet plus. I mean, he got to be six feet plus. You can have somebody in your life who loves the Lord with all of their heart, will treat you right, will serve you right. But because they five, six is a deal breaker. Y'all not talking to me. Five, six, I don't want to have to look down to you, bro. I don't want to have to look down to you. I'm talking about can honor you, treat you like royalty. But since this brother is five, six, and he's attractive too. Handsome, you can tell he takes care of his body. Beard, however you want him. But he's five, six, it's a deal breaker. I gotta have somebody that's six feet. Mm -hmm. And I, I gotta have me a high value man. I have to have me a man who makes some bread. Bread is like a millennial and Generation Z terminology to mean they must have some financial stability. <laughs> they must have money. Yeah, I, I'm talking about a high value man. He got to have six figures in the bank minimum. I'm talking about, and he has to take care of his body. He has to have broad shoulders. I want him to have a six pack. Okay, we're talking about six feet. We're talking about six figures. We're talking about a six pack. Girl, you're going to end up with the devil. All them sixes. But you know what? That's your type. That's your type. <laughs> you could be compatible with the very thing that is toxic to your destiny. Listen, there's a certain offer that you want, a certain opportunity that you want. It will come your way and you will immediately claim that this is God, even without prayer. Because this is what I prefer. Listen, y'all. This is why all throughout the discernment series, I was trying to get us to understand that when God plants something, the enemy's planting something too. Remember, weeds and wheat. Same season, same soil, the same time. God is planting, the enemy is planting. God is working, the enemy is working. Just because it starts sprouting doesn't mean it's wheat. It could be weeds. I have to seek God's counsel. I have to seek his direction because every open door is not God. Some opportunities are spiritual ambushes playing dress up, but they're your type. They're your type. You can be compatible with the very thing that is toxic for your destiny. That's the first thing. The second thing, I tried to get us to understand this back in March of this year. Compatibility is season-based. Yeah, 
is season-based. They can be compatible with the season of your struggle, but they can't be compatible with the season of your success. Well, I want somebody who's ride or die. You know what I'm saying? I want somebody who will be there if I hit rock bottom. What if, what if they're only compatible with your rock bottom, though? But they're not compatible with your upward season. This is so good. So now the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is this really compatibility or is this just shared dysfunction? We're both broken in the same area. We're both wounded over the same thing. We both have the same feelings over the same brokenness, so we end up sharing hearts. But what happens if one of you heals? If one of you heals, now listen, just because you heal doesn't mean you can make them heal. You are not God. You can't change people. God is the only one that can change people. Just because you heal doesn't mean they will heal. And if you heal and they don't, you will remove what y'all had in common. Compatibility is season-based. Let's go a little bit deeper. Two caterpillars, they are compatible until they both get cocooned. Because one can come out a butterfly and the other can come out a moth. See, y'all learn something tonight. Y'all probably thought they all come out butterflies. No, ma'am, do your research. Google it. One can come out a butterfly and the other one could come out a moth. A butterfly is diurnal. A moth is nocturnal. It only flies in the dark. So you thought y'all were compatible because y'all were together when y'all were crawling. But it took for the cocoon of pressure. It took for a season of a pandemic. It took for something to happen in your life for you, for you to discover that this wasn't a butterfly. This was a moth. And I want us, please hear me. I want us to be so secure in who God is making you that you don't end up feeling guilty because you have wings, but they're still crawling. Hear me. Some people are only compatible with the crawling version of you. This is why it's so hard to let certain people go because they were there the whole time you were crawling. <laughs> y'all should see y'all faces. This is good. This is why it's so hard because you recognize now, when you hear messages like this, you recognize now I was compatible with somebody who only loved the dark version of me. I, I, I was compatible with somebody who only loved the sexual immoral part of me. I was compatible with the individual that that part of me, I'm trying to keep in the grave. But every time I'm around them, they begin to shake the grave. <laughs> so good, y'all. Compatible are liking the very thing that was fatal for my destiny. So now I have to forgive them. Not you might have to. You must. I have to forgive them and also forgive myself for all the times I love stuff that was fatal. Can we talk? Can we talk? Betrayal hits different when it's somebody that you handed your heart to and in return they handed you back heartaches. It hits different when it's an individual that gave you the best memories but now all they are is a memory. And so now you're here with all these shattered pieces wondering how could somebody who said they love me act like they don't know me? It is different. But forgiveness frees the prisoner. And once you forgive, you'll discover that the prisoner was you. Bitterness only contaminates the container. And so I have to forgive them and I also have to forgive myself because now I recognize that God could turn broken pieces into masterpieces. He could turn broken pieces into masterpieces. You are his masterpiece. The master gives you peace. He'll put his word in your heart and mouth. And now you have a mouthpiece. Bars. Did y'all hear what I just said? Did y'all hear what I just said? You're the masterpiece. The master gives you peace. He puts the word in your heart and mouth. Now you have a mouthpiece. I need an album. I need to drop something. <laughs> what if the very thing that you are labeling as a blessing is really toxicity to your destiny? 
See, hear me out. Listen, when it's a blessing from God, you will not have to exchange your mental health as payment to keep it. I need to say that one more time. When it's a blessing from God, you will not have to exchange your mental health as payment to keep it. Maybe the reason you're so exhausted is because you're breastfeeding toxicity to maintain an image of happiness to make everybody believe what you labeled as a blessing really is. So now I'm tired because I'm telling everybody this was a blessing, but it really wasn't a blessing. It was just your type. Can I get somebody to say my type? I can't speak for anybody else, but I've arrived to the place in my life where I want kingdom success, emphasis on kingdom. I want kingdom success and my sanity. Right? Kingdom success and cultural success is different. I want kingdom success and my sanity. I don't want to lose my mind trying to keep up with an appearance. I want to have joy off, outside of social media. Like offline, I want to have joy. I'm not just posting smiles. I have one when you can't even see it. I want authentic, only given by the Messiah joy. And that's going to require for me to learn, God, what is your desire versus what is my desire? King Solomon loved many foreign women. The ones that God said, do not marry them or make a treaty with them. I want to show y'all this. I want to show you this. Just like the end of verse 2 into verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look at this. It says, make no treaty with them. Are y'all reading your Bible? Y'all didn't say that. I'm asking again with the same emphasis. Are y'all reading your Bible? He says, make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy and do not intermarry with them. Now look at this. First Kings chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Are y'all catching this, y'all? He made a treaty. The very thing God said don't do. He made a treaty with the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Now look at this. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around it. Don't judge Solomon because this is missionary marriage at his finest. Missionary dating at his finest. Let me give you a shock and illumination. You don't have to flirt to convert. I am, sis. You don't have to flirt to convert. Don't make a treaty with them. Don't marry them. This brother goes, gets somebody from Egypt, and brings them over into the city of David. I like to call this the mixture Christian. The mixture Christian. Meaning, I want what's in Egypt, but then I also want what's in the city of David at the same time. Mixture. I want my way. <laughs> I, I want what God wants, but then I also want what I want at the same time. Mixture. Like, I want a godly woman. I really do, bro. I want a godly woman. I do. But I also want to sex this baddie that I met down in Miami, too, at the same time. I want them both. Like, I want a kingdom man. I do. Lord, you know I do. But I want to hold on to my desire for a kingdom man while also entertaining an ex at the same time. I want them both. Y'all quiet, which means I must be preaching to somebody. I want both. And then we wonder why we're not getting narrow way blessings. I want them both. I want them both. The degree of mixture. We see it in Solomon. I want Pharaoh's daughter and I also want to build the city of David. I, I, I want them both. Could it be possible that the very thing that you're not releasing is the very thing that's keeping you from being released? See, we have to talk about this, y'all. There is a massive need and a massive need for us to discuss the area of what we call attractive and my type. Hear me. When you know your God-given assignment, you could differentiate between attractive 
and attracted. Hear me. When something is attractive, that's cool. I only get attracted if I see fruit. All right? See, what do we need to unlearn? Unlearn the cultural's view of attraction. Learn kingdom view of attraction. I need to see some fruit there. Don't go just off of physical attractiveness. Yes, they're fine on their exterior. Oh, but if you can see the state of their soul. Oh, if we can see people's soul. If we can see what's going on in the inside. Yes, they are candy, but they're not soul food. And I hear you, somebody already online, but listen, God ain't calling me to nobody that's un unattractive. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I'm turning off right now. I'm a logger. I just can't do it. He's only God, sis. Dudes think like this too. He's only God. Like he only knows you. He's not going to give you somebody that looks like Freddy Krueger and say, this is my will. Love them in spite. <laughs> he only knows you. Like, he only knows every hair follicle on your head. He only stretched out the heavens like a curtain. He only knows every single star in the sky by name. He's only, like, been here forever. He only knows your past, present, and your future. He only knows your end for the beginning. He's only God. <laughs> Whatever God has for you, if marriage is your journey, you will be attracted to them. It's just that some of us are spiritually underaged to where we're only looking for eye candy, but we're not looking for fruit. Amen. Does he or she have self-control? That's a fruit of the spirit. That's what makes you even more attractive. Have we arrived to the place where godliness is attractive? <laughs> it's getting quiet. This is good, bro. It's getting quiet. Godliness is attractive and the reason we have to unlearn this is because I cannot solve the problem with the same mindset that created it and for many of us our problem is our type our type our preference so much so to where when God speaks we can't even hear him because he's not speaking the language of your preference so when you hear something that you really don't like you label that as the enemy when it really could be God this is so good, y'all. By the way, I would like to speak from this thought, from this subject, just for a few more moments on tonight. Unlearning my type. Can I get somebody to say, unlearning my type? Here's a confession I want us to say. Can I get everybody to say this? It's quiet, so I know it's real. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for this message. Can I get everybody to put this in the room and all caps and everybody under the sound of my voice? It's short, but can we say this confession? Speak it over our lives. Can I get everybody to say, Father? Father. I'm not convinced. Father? Father. Detox, me Detox me from my preferences. From my preferences. One more time. Father? Father. Detox me from my, preferences. from my preferences. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, a king. Your mother is accredited to be the contributor of Proverbs 31. But nevertheless, Solomon loved many strange women, held fast to many foreign women in love. This word on tonight is going to get in your business. Yep. This word on tonight is going to make a lot of us uncomfortable. You're not sweating physically like me, but your flesh is sweating. Because you're hearing a word that is a demolition project to your outlook. This, this, this word on tonight is going to perform some surgery because I believe God is trying to reveal to many of us this is an area, and due to this particular trait that many of us have, it's an area where the enemy is wreaking havoc in our life undercover. This is a lawn that he is slithering in, and the reason we can't see him is due to the tall grass of our preference. Let me say this one more time. This is a lawn where the enemy is slithering in, and the reason you can't see him is because the grass of your preference is so high. So I can't even see the enemy is working in this area of my life. I can't even see that the enemy is behind this production that is keeping me in the cycle of recycled pain. Recycled pain because of what I 
like. Can I get somebody to say my preferences? And sometimes God will send you somebody who comes in your life and will say, hey, maybe the problem is what you like. No, uh, th- that wasn't the devil. That's your type. D- don't, don't get religious. Th- that, that's, that's not somebody trying to throw you off. You like that type. <laughs> what you label as your preference, that, that's the issue. But because we grown, because I'm grown and you could do you and I'm going to do me, we'll end up mislabeling the person that God sent in your life to warn you as a hater. <laughs> they a hater. They just mad that ain't nobody hollering at them. They just mad that they DMs don't look like this. They just mad. They a hater. They a hater. So you cut the relationship, and then you get churchy on them, and then starting to say stuff like, "Yeah, um, they weren't good for me. God blocked it." No, he didn't. God didn't block it. Your attitude pushed them away. Yet your offendedness to accountability. Talk, Holy Spirit. Your offendedness to accountability pushed them away. That's why they stopped calling. It's not that they don't love you. It's just that trying to help you shouldn't cause me injuries. Y'all not talking to me. Helping you shouldn't cause me injuries. Mental injuries, physical injuries, emotional injuries. Like, I have no problem helping you, but why are you cursing me out? Some people are so used, they're so used to unhealthy, indirect communication that healthy and direct communication feels like an attack. (laughs) No, God didn't block this. It's just that I'm not receptive. I'm not receptive for accountability because it's my type. I'm talking about the way you like him to the way you like her to the way You like things to go to the way you don't like things to go to the way you like setting your AC on a certain temperature. Some of us had the heat on today and y'all tripping (laughs) to the way you don't want any AC to the way that you prefer your food to the way that you prefer God to move preferences, 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 my type, my will, what I desire, preferences, preferences, preferences. Many of us have been so absorbed in our preferences that we label anything that is not what we prefer something that God did not send. Can I get somebody to say preferences? But here's a dangerous thing, y'all. When you live in your preferences, it's highly problematic because hell sends what you prefer. That just roundhouse kicks somebody in the neck bone. Listen, hell sins what you prefer. God sins what's purposeful. We are looking for what we prefer. God is looking what's going to make you fruitful. I may not do what you want me to do. I'm not saying that God won't give you things many times that are your preference. But that comes to a place when our preferences become his preferences. When I desire only what God wants me to have, it's not just about me. It's not just about what people think. I truly want the Holy Spirit to be glorified in and through my life. It's possible. The very thing you like is killing you softly. Not with his song, but killing you softly with your type. Killing you softly. (laughs) It's possible that your very preferences are the antagonists to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life. I'm trying to mold you into the next level version of yourself. It's been in you the whole time, but you can't see it. I'm trying to mold you. That's what I prefer. I'm trying to mold in you patience and mold in you joy and mold in you confidence and mold in you faith and mold in you devotion and mold in you worship and mold in you godliness and mold in you purity. And I'm not just trying to mold in you. I'm also trying to mold stuff out. I'm trying to mold out bitterness. I'm trying to mold out entitlement. I'm trying to mold out arrogance. I'm trying to mold out those wounds that you don't talk about. That you don't talk about that have affected your personality. I'm trying to get that person back. 
You weren't like that until you dated them. You weren't like that until you married them. You weren't like that until you experienced that church hurt. You're not an introvert. You're into hurt. Because this is not who you were before you met them or before you experienced that. I'm trying to mold that back. I'm trying to get that back. But you're so caught up with what you prefer and how you prefer God to move. So many of us are upset at God due to a deadline you gave him. You frustrated, upset, feeling like he's not answering your prayers because you gave God a deadline like he's on your clock. Preferences, preferences, preferences. See, sometimes God answers our prayers by not answering our prayer. <laughs> like you're saying, God, I need you to help me with anger. Like this dude on my job, they come at me one more. Help them stay in their cubicle, stay on their side. Matter of fact, give them, like, give them a transfer at another location. There's an opening in Atlanta. There's an opening in Chicago. God, I need for you to move them because they're getting on my everlasting nerve. You want me to be godly? Move them. And God's like, I know that's what you prefer. But how are you going to exercise patience by avoidance? Amen. See? See? Somebody got to think, God, help me, help me with my anger. Oh, I'm going to help you all right. <laughs> I'm going to help you all right. I, I can't help you with avoidance. We bless those that hate us. That's what we do in the kingdom. We bless those that curse us. That's what we do in the kingdom. If they go low, we go high. That's what we do in the kingdom. But you'll never have the opportunity to do that if I move them. Hmm. Sometimes what we label, gosh, I feel this, y'all. We run from things that make us grow. We run from things that make us better. We run from things that hold us accountable. We run from sermons. We run from teaching. We run from small groups. We run from podcasts because there's a method that you want God to do it. And just like we were articulating on the panel, many of us have been mislabeling victories. Listen, if you lost them, but you found you, you won. Look, that's not what you prefer, but that's what I prefer. So that I can mold you into the son and to the daughter of God that I cosmically created for you to be. If the relationship failed, but you developed a prayer life from that, you won. Some of us are praying more. <laughs> We're praying more now than we've ever prayed before. The only thing that is, that's kind of like disheartening as a pastor is I usually can tell when people break up. Because you, not saying this is any of y'all, okay? I don't know y'all married. I don't know y'all relationship status. But usually I can tell when people break up because they end up on the front row. Seriously. Not saying it's y'all. I don't know. Front row. When, it, when we meet somebody, third row. Fourth row, fifth row, sixth row. I don't even know how many rows we got in here. 18th row. By the time y'all break up, I know it because you're back. Front row. Don't say nothing. It's amazing how we don't even see people cause us to drift. We don't even... See, when, when Solomon brought this Pharaoh's daughter over into the city of David, that was the genesis of his compromise. Listen, spiritual decay happens one compromise at a time. It's that one boundary that you say is not that bad. It's that one time that you say, but we ain't did nothing. It's just that one time it just causes you to drift. Third row, fourth row, fifth row, then you like Pluto. I don't know why I'm rhyming on tonight. I promise. It's not on purpose. It's not. God is trying to show us, like, look, if you lost them, but you found you and me, you won. If the relationship failed, but you discovered a prayer life, you won. I know that's not what you prefer, but it's what I prefer. Because it's causing for you to be the son, and it's causing for you to be the daughter that I cosmically created. If you didn't get the position and you didn't get the promotion, but you learned character along the way, you won. I know that's not what you prefer, but it's what I prefer so that you can be the son or the daughter of God that I'm cosmically creating for you to be. If they rejected you, but that's not what I have for you anyway, you won. You won. I know that's not what you prefer, but it's what I prefer. To build you as my son or as my daughter, this is how I cosmically created you. 
If the financial floodwaters rose, which caused for you to be more innovative with your gift and heighten your dependency on heaven. See, listen, sometimes limitation is the breeding ground of innovation. You didn't know you were that creative until you had to be. You didn't know you had a millionaire, millionaire idea until you had to be in a position where I got to do something. I have to make something. I have to figure it out. Limitation, many times, is the breeding ground of innovation. I know you didn't want to start your ministry like that. I know that you didn't want your book to be authored like this, but it's not what you prefer. But it's what I prefer because I'm the one that's trying to mold my son or my daughter into the person I cosmically created for them to be. So listen, the genesis of unlearning our type begins with A, knowing your assignment, and B, knowing what's good for your spiritual well-being and soul care. Okay? I had to break this down. The genesis of unlearning our preference begins with A, knowing my assignment. You're not going to know who's good for you if you don't know what you're supposed to do. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to know who to take with you. You're not. When Jerry had his cross collision and met Jesus for real, for real, I was like for fake, for fake for a long time. But like in 2006, when I was in the club and I was like, this is just not me. It's hot. It smells like weed. It stinks. I don't like it here. I want to go home. I don't want to dance. I want to go home. I shouldn't have rode with my roommate. Please, I always drive your own car. I did not want to be here. When I met Christ for real and I knew that God called me to be a pastor, immediately what I was attracted to changed. Look at this. Look at this. I could see an attractive woman, but now I'm looking through the lens. Could she be a pastor's wife? She looks good. Eye candy. But is this soul food good for my assignment? So it didn't matter how long I knew a woman. It didn't, know, it didn't matter how cool we were. Because I knew what God called me to do, it caused a breakup. Listen, y'all, when you meet Jesus and you discover your destiny, it will always come with a breakup. Always. Knowing my assignment caused me to end the relationship. And here's the thing. When you know where you're going, you get over it faster. (laughs) I was like, man, did that hurt? Yeah, it kind of did, but I got a concert tonight. (laughs) It kind of did, but I got a small group tonight. Yeah, it kind of did, but I'm working with a step team tonight. Yeah, it's going. I just got over it faster because I immediately got in purpose. Discipleship and in purpose expedites the healing process. It's when you don't know where you're going and there's nobody discipling you, the hurt gets heavier. That's A. I'm learning. My type starts with knowing my assignment. B. I have to know what's good for my spiritual well being and soul care. So we've got to understand this. If we want to have People in our life that are good for our souls. Some people say soulmate. The word soulmate is not in the Bible. But the Bible does have a lot to say about your soul and who you do life with. We just read that. Don't marry them. But Solomon loved them anyway. So the Bible has a lot to say about your soul and a lot to say about your relationships. So if I want to have something healthy for my soul, I have to understand that soul in the Greek is psyche. It comes from, it comes from the word how we get psychology. So your soul is your psychological, emotional self that includes your mind, your thought, your emotions, your reasoning, and your desires, your feelings. That is your soul. When we think of a partner or a mate, mate summons fruitfulness. Okay, so if I'm in agriculture and I have a livestock, I have female and I have a male, it's mating season. I bring them together so that they can produce fruit of more livestock, okay? So when we say, I want a soul mate, I'm saying I want somebody who summons fruitfulness in my life. Did y'all see how all that connected? I know that's a lot, but I got to revisit some things. When you unlearn what culture views as attractive, I just need to say this for somebody The reason you're so insecure is because you're going off culture's view of beauty. I promise there's nothing wrong with you. You are comparing your beauty to a generation that crops, add filters, and remove blemishes. 
and you're questioning God's handiwork. I promise, if you begin to look at what the Bible calls beautiful, beauty is in godliness. Some of the finest people are ugly. Amen. Going up, fruitless. That's ugly to me. Fruitless. Don't even want to summon fruit. All they can do is take good pictures. They're real photogenic. But they're not good for my soul. Summons fruitfulness. Now listen, for you to even think like this, it requires spiritual maturity. And the reason many people keep on picking eye candy instead of soul food is because spiritual maturity, this is for grown folk. I'm still spiritually underage if I'm just looking at physical traits versus the fruit that the Holy Spirit summons. Somebody say soul. So fruit production requires maturity. And I'm not talking about when I say soul food, I'm not talking about greens, beans, tomatoes. I'm talking about fruit of the spirit, joy. Is that attractive to you? He's gentle. Like, I know the times have changed, but I'm like, okay, what was so attractive about thugs? I still don't get it. I need a soldier. <laughs> I, t- I don't understand. I don't. When he gets mad, that wall could become your face. I want a hot boy. What you need, girl? I need a hot... Really? Hot boys aren't satisfied with the fire in the home. They find fire in other apartments and... Y'all don't want to talk to me. Sex doesn't keep people. The fear of God does. The fear of God is what keeps an individual. I'm attracted to joy. I'm attracted to gentleness. I'm attracted to self-control. I'm attracted to long-suffering. This is fruit production. I learned all that other stuff, car, house, and all that stuff, swag. I learned that. Fruit. Fruit. Chemistry is not going to keep you character will. Fineness is not going to keep you godliness will. Go off of fruit, and it takes time. You don't fall in love with fruit. Oh, we just fell in love at the first sight. You don't even have a chance to see if it's fruit yet. You just look at him, man, that's some godly fruit. I just fell over in love. I need time to evaluate. <laughs> this is good, y'all. I know some of us don't like it, but it's good. Listen, the beauty of this is you have to understand, God does not bring somebody in your life for romance. He does. I know this might mess you up. He doesn't. God is not in heaven like, man. They've been so faithful, they deserve romance. <laughs> it's getting cold outside, too. You know it's called cold when you can see the exhaust pipe smoking. You can see your breath, like it's cold outside. God's not in heaven like, you know what, they deserve somebody. They've been faithful, they've been taught. Did they... God sends somebody not for romance, but to advance. <laughs> Couples that he brings together, it's more about advance than romance. They will advance my will together. They will advance my kingdom together. But listen, if you're not advancing nothing in your singleness. Oh, Lord. If you're not advancing in your singleness, because I know a lot of us think we're waiting. You're not. When your kingdom, waiting never feels like waiting. It doesn't feel like waiting. There's too much to do. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You sit and wait and wait. When you start advancing, when you get your eyes off what you want, when you get your eyes off your preferences and you start helping somebody, serving somewhere, pouring into somebody, then that's when God recognizes this is an individual that they can advance together. Also, no, marriage is not an upgrade from singleness. It's not the church has to stop making single people feel like because you're not married that God is limiting a blessing for you. Marriage is not an upgrade for singleness. Every person who is single does not desire to be married. And just because you don't desire it does not mean something is wrong with you. I promise you it doesn't. You're single tonight. If you want to turn on your heat, you can. If I was there, we would have problems because I'm sweating. It's hot. You don't have to worry about none of that. So when you go off fruit, watch this, it's so powerful. When you go off fruit, you're able to identify sticks from branches. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, 
I am the vine, you are the, talk to me, talk to me loud, you are the, one more time, you are the, let's get on one accord, y'all, one band, all right, come on, you are the, thank you, he who abides in me and I in him bears much, what's the word, fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire and they are burned. When you go off fruit, you can immediately recognize those who are branch versus those who are stick. Sticks have no fruit. Sticks have no fruit. I'm looking for fruitfulness. Not because I don't have any fruit on my own. I'm already producing fruit. I already got an orange. I already got a grape. What you got? Would this compliment the kingdom or would this compliment my flesh? And you have to understand the reason I'm parking so hard on this particular topic is because this is an area the enemy is tricking us in. Our type for many of us has caused for us to enter into recovery seasons for years. Recovery, recovery, recovery. And I get it, y'all. I'm like, you know, I think this is what the enemy does. Puberty is hell's alarm clock. <laughs> I really do believe it. It's it. Okay, now they could go off hormones. Now they could be in a war zone. So what I want to do, I want them to not hear messages like this. I told us discipleship for, should first start in the home. It's not my job. It's not children's church job. Amen. It's your daddy's job, your mama's job. That's where it should start, in the home. So if they don't have that at 13 Maybe if I can get them to make an unwise choice. Now they're dealing with all this through high school. You're a little smarter when you're 18, but you're not that smart when you're 18 because you're still going up all your emotions and you think you're so in love with this person, but they have never long suffered for you and you still haven't understood spiritual responsibilities yet. And so now you make another unwise choice. And now you're hurt. Maybe at 21, you have your first child. Then maybe at 23, you have your next child. And then maybe at 26, you have your next child. And then by 28, you want to get your life right. And now you're like, God, where is he at? Seriously. I know we don't like this, it's the truth. It's like we spend so much time doing what we want. So much time doing what we want. But then as soon as we make up our mind, God, I'm going to do what you want. We want him to expedite the process. And what I'm trying to get us to see is God's like, okay, I'm not holding what you did against you because the blood covers that. I, I don't see everything you've done, but you do have to detox. You do need to unlearn your type. You do need to learn my voice. You're asking for me to send another voice when you don't know mine yet. You don't know my, if I were to send you somebody right now, we barely talk now. We barely converse now. I hear from you now more than I ever have because this is a pandemic. We haven't been talking and I'm not holding that against you. I'm not punishing. This is not legalism. It's not by works. But I'm trying to get you to understand that you have to be purged from all of the choices that have affected the way you think. Listen, brothers, I don't care how fine she gets. What you are getting is the way she thinks. Listen, it's her mindset that's going to help you raise your babies. Not her boobs and her backside. I got to talk real. My generation requires it. Can she think, though? If every picture she takes is of her butt, maybe that's the only thing she could offer you, sir. I know we don't like it, but we require real. I don't care that it's cold and you're alone. The way this brother thinks, the way he processes, does he create scenarios? He's mad because he thought of something. Why you didn't answer your phone? No, nah, I knew you. I, I checked your little way. Why? Thinking up scenario. Bro, you need some healing in your head. You need some healing in your head. Seriously. It, it, you don't just get their body. You get the way they think. I need to know how they think. I need somebody who has understand that I have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. It's not off eye candy. It's off soul food. 
You're not just getting their body, you're getting the way they think. And Satan hates this and he attacks this. Look at this, Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. It says, has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. This is the whole agenda. God wants godly marriages because godly marriage produces godly offspring. And godly offspring produces a godly community. And a godly community produces a godly generation. And a godly generation produces a godly nation. Do you see this? Amen. Your relational picks matter. Amen. They matter. I'm dealing with this on Sunday. I don't even have time to deal with it on tonight. Solomon was not just dealing with his type. He was also dealing with a spirit. His daddy had a lust problem. His daddy had a lust issue. He had wives, but he over there looking at Bathsheba while she bathing. He was thirsty. <laughs> he's supposed to be at war fighting, but he's looking at Bathsheba. You will always end up in wars that you don't even need to fight when you're out of position. Look at this, y'all. Rahab, the harlot, was in David's bloodline. This is a woman whose lifestyle was in sexual immorality. Rahab the prostitute, okay? David had a lust issue. It wasn't until Nathan came and told him, like, bro, you the man. You taking Uriah's wife? That's foul, bro. You the man. Now Solomon, he was a whole nother level. He had a thousand. I'm like, Lord, my wife is enough. And she's godly and, every, and everything awesome. But I'm like, one is enough. Could you imagine a thousand minds? A thousand mindsets? But listen, lust doesn't use logic. Lust doesn't think. Sunday I want to deal with God killed my lust. Because a lot of us are entertaining things due to a lustful spirit that was before you ever even got here. This is why at a young age it was a battle. You're dealing with a spirit, not just your type. Few things and I'm done. Point number one, the fruit of assignment. Unlearn your type. Go off of the fruit of assignment. Do our purposes complement. Now, purpose is your life's bullseye. Purpose is your life's bullseye. It's where you aim. So when I'm considering fruit, do we aim in the same direction together? Because whenever we don't have a target, we will date aimless. We'll be married aimless. It's about fruit production. Please hear me. A couple could be married 20 years and bear no fruit. I know we clap. Such a Johnson and Johnson been married 25 years. My God. I know we clap for that. You could be married for 20 years and have no fruit. And a couple could be married for six months and have more fruit than a couple that's been married 20 years. It's not about marital length. It's about fruitfulness. Number two, the fruit of character. The fruit of character. Will you tell the truth? Even if it's ugly, will you be honest? I don't, I should not have to be Inspector Gadget to be with you. For real. I shouldn't have to look in your phone. My wife can grab my phone. I don't even think twice about it. What, what you do? I don't have to think twice about it. The fruit of character. Somebody say character. character. Listen, y'all. When you have entertained foolishness, a history of trauma can cause for you to excuse and ignore mistreatment because you survived worse. It's too much to say. They got to watch the replay. <laughs> too, I've survived worse. We're not going off bare minimum. Bare minimum feels like royal treatment when you're settling. Okay? Number three, the fruit of values. A moth and a butterfly will always have different values. You value sexual purity. They don't. You value reading the Bible. They don't. Y'all can have different Bible apps and stuff. That's fine. My new version has several streaks from several weeks. When the last time you read your Bible? Do you read your Bible or is it a dust collector? This is something I value. So we have to unlearn culture. I value fruit. Somebody say fruit. The fruit of faith. We have to both believe in Jesus. 
Okay, we have to both believe in Jesus. You believe in Allah, I believe in Jesus. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. Jesus is the only way for me. This is what I believe. And you don't feel bad because you have healthy, holistic apologetics. You know how to defend your faith. The problem is many of us want to believe things that we really don't believe. You want to believe Jesus will always make a way out of no way. But if you be honest, you struggle with believing it. And so it's easy for an atheist, agnostic, or another faith to talk you out of what you believe because you really only say you believe it because you grew up in children's church. I have to know what I believe, the fruit of my faith. It's not legalism. It's can the two walk together unless they agree. Be not unequally yoked. I have to understand that too, being unequally yoked doesn't mean that we're both Christians and we're yoked up together. Y'all could be both Christians, but you have a different assignment and they have a different assignment. And y'all are not equally yoked. The only thing that y'all have in common is y'all both love Jesus. What do y'all have in common outside of that? That's when we go back to the fruit of assignment. You could be a missionary over in Sudan. She could be a teacher over here in the hood. I need you home, sir, where you can lead my family. You a Christian, she a Christian, but our purposes are probably not going to work right now. Yeah. Make sense? All right. Next one, the fruit of devotion. I pray. I seek God's counsel. If I don't know his voice in devotion, I won't know it in direction. This is something I'm looking for in fruit. Next one, the fruit of counsel. Can anybody correct us? When we are together, if we do slip up, who can hold you accountable? Who do you call when your flesh is on fire? I have to have somebody to counsel us. I could never come down to this altar and say I do to anybody without getting somebody else looking over it. I need counsel. It's quiet in here, y'all. The fruit of counsel. And I'm going to go to these last few points. I'm going to go fast because I'm out of time and I want us to get this. Can I get somebody to say prefer? What we prefer is what I want. When you surrender, it's what heaven needs. Prefer. Prefer is I give God my deadline. The surrendered life is I'm on waiter time. I'm serving while I'm waiting. The bigger you serve, the better your tip. Prefer. My happiness. When you live a life about what you prefer, it's all about your happiness. When you live a life of surrender, it's all about obedience. Obedience opens doors that you never have to knock on. Prefer. It's about modified behavior. I change my behavior based on people watching me. Surrender. It's a heart metamorphosis. God doesn't want you to just have facelifts. He wants you to have heart transplants. Last one. Prefer. You're a control freak. You, you're a control freak. You want things your way. When you want it, you try to control everything. The surrender life, I submit. Tap out. I submit. God, I'm on your clock. I'm on your time. What you say goes. You're my king. You're my Lord. And Father, whatever it is that you have to detox me from, from 13 to 28, I'm willing to embrace the detox because maybe what I prefer is the assassin to my peace and the assassin to my spiritual growth and the assassin to my sanity. But God, would you give us the patience for you to, re to recalibrate our hearts. God, help us to detox from everything that's not like you. The way we want you to do it. When, when we want you to do it. Sin what we want. The way that we want it. God, forgive us for talking to you like we were made. We were made to do what we want versus made to give you the glory. And in this moment, God, we repent. We repent for being control freaks. Trying to control our life. Control what we want to do. And God, we ask you to take over. We wave our white flag. We surrender. Because your way is the best way. It may not be what we prefer, but it will summon fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.